Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Edinger and Brian Broom, and today we're continuing our conversation about the first commandment. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Last week, we talked about how no other gods before me means no other gods at all, and how this God, the Lord, is the one who freely gives us his son and with him all things. Today, we're going to look more at the sovereignty of God, not exclusively in the sense that it's often used interchangeably with the word providence to mean God's working all things together for his glory and for the good of his people. Sovereignty does mean that, but it also means his comprehensive claim to authority. The sovereign of a land has authority to set laws and see that they are obeyed. God claims complete authority over creation since he's the creator. And in the first commandment, he claims authority as redeemer of his people as well. He brought them out of the house of bondage. And this authority is likewise complete, as it's not just over external formalities, but as Jesus tells us, over the heart He says the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's pretty comprehensive. Uh, So Greg, why don't you talk to us a little bit about what that means and what that might look like when you have a community of people in whom God is accomplishing this purpose? You know, one of our ongoing themes in this podcast is the New Jerusalem. And that's we, we talked about that sort of last time. And I would like to, I'd like to read a passage from Micah to hopefully continue on. Micah 4, verse 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more, but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. And none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. For all people will walk every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. I've always been especially fond of this passage as it describes the the triumph of the gospel within history. But for many, many years, I was bothered by that last little part. For all people will walk every one in the name of his God. It seemed like The prophet was taking back everything he had just given. God's people will serve him, but everyone else is going to serve their own God. But eventually I realized, oh, he's just summing up a general truth. All people will walk everyone in the name of his God. This is what we were talking about last time. You walk in the way of your God, whoever or whatever that God is. Ideas have consequences. The commitment of the heart flows out into life and culture. And so when God claims our hearts, he claims all of us all of our ways. And we we know what those claims look like because he specified them in scripture, in the Bible, in written propositional communication. We don't have to feel our way along. We don't have to wait on visions and hunches. We are not left to deduce from a rational creation what would probably be the best way to go about serving God. God has actually told us in inspired and infallible scripture, uh, who he is, and what, therefore, we ought to be as we image him and live out uh, his calling upon us. Now, in this particular passage, we see many nations, and we began to look at, last time, I don't remember how far we actually got, the idea of multiculturalism. And and I, I want to get this in so we get to it at some point. <laughs> A culture that has has two fountains. We, we, we saw the, the last one mostly last time, and that's the human heart. Culture rises out of the, the commitment of the heart to this God or that. But of course, there's a palette or another fountain against which that works, and that's the external universe that God has given us. People 
have a genetic history. They have a political history. They live in a particular latitude, a particular climate. They live near the ocean or far from the ocean, up in the mountains or out in the desert. They have access to this kind of fruit or vegetable that grows well where they are, but not to something else that doesn't grow well anywhere near they are. They can trade with their neighbors, but then they then we have, well, everybody has different sorts of neighbors too. And have there been any earthquakes, tornadoes, <laughs> hurricanes, or anything lately that are pretty well, or floods, that are pretty well wiped out all of our heritage? So compared to other nations around, we may look rather primitive because we're having to start over. All of these are external things that different kinds of religious impulses can work at or paint against. And in each case, things will look different, to, to put it simply, let's start with something that's not Christian. American animism, and there is such a thing, will not look like uh, animism in Papua New Guinea in the uh, 1900s or, or 1200s. They will be very different, al although the religion may be apparently similar. The manifestation within the culture will be different because different things are involved. Papua New Guinea was, was shut off from the rest of the world until missionaries in the early 20th century began to penetrate the darkness. And so we grew up with in terms of other people who believe pretty much the same thing and had the same religious spins. In America, it has to compete with materialism, Christianity, Marxism, all kinds of things, a high-tech culture. And so it's going to manifest differently. Or to go the other direction with Christianity, Christianity as it entered, say, uh, Southern Africa uh, in the uh, in the 1900s began to produce various sorts of manifestations, cultural manifestations, uh, say in among the Bantu people or the tribes more to the, I guess it would be East or Swahili, Swahili is the dominant language, among those who had contact with white men, among those who didn't so much, but the word got to them anyway take that and then compare it with Scotch Presbyterianism or the German uh, German Reformed churches or Pentecostalism in Los Angeles in uh, the early 20th century. All of these are different manifestations of Christianity and all produce different sorts of cultures, different liturgies, different music, different ways of dressing. And, and we have to allow for that sort of multiculturalism. That's valid. We all have gifts, we all have talents, we all have different places where truth can manifest itself or the gospel can manifest itself. The heart commitment, however, is something else. And as Christians, we have to insist that the starting point for any examination of, of the broader culture has to be this. No other gods, Jesus is Lord by virtue of creation, by virtue of redemption. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. And whatever we do, we have to do out of faith for the glory of God and in terms of his written word. And interestingly enough, although that's in a way very simple, and I bet, by the way, I just paraphrased the Heidelberg Catechism on what are good works. Mm -hmm. The church kind of struggles with this. And maybe that's kind of some of the stuff we can talk about or any other thing that you want to uh, introduce at this point. Uh, when we use the word culture, what is it that we mean? Well, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we mentioned last week how it's not just like opera and paintings and etiquette and things like that, but it's sort of the outflow of a group of people making stuff. That's, that's pretty that's, good definition. That's pretty right good. <laughs> All right, we'll roll with that then. I mean, um, you're right. It's, it's a group of people. A hermit generally doesn't have a culture. I was reading, I think it was uh, Van Til on um, Henry Van Til on uh, the Calvinist conception of culture. And he mentioned Robinson Crusoe. I was like, well, yeah, there's that. But think, Robinson Crusoe came on a ship, came in clothes, had an education. He could go out to the ship. Ever seen the Bugs Bunny cartoon where Yosemite Sam has to keep going out to the, he's, he's Robinson Crusoe, has to keep going out to the ship to get a match and come back. And Okay, well, look, look, Looney Tunes. Look at <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's remembering it's remembering something that most people forget. Robinson Crusoe was not on his own. The ship was beached out there a ways, and he was able to get lots of cultural artifacts off the ship. And so he was not in isolation. Cultures are the outgrowth of 
groups of people, maybe as small as a family, Adam and Eve were only two, although they were married and would produce children at the time. But we are looking at a combined effort, a social effort. They are producing things. Interesting that word should come up. I'm having to do grammar online. And I was just thinking through, okay, noun, person, place, thing, or idea. No, it's not. I just think, think. Oh, is idea the new thing I'm supposed to learn? No, this idea thing. So I went online and found out that, yes, indeed, the traditional form and the still insistent form is person, place, or thing. If it's not a person or place, it's a thing. Ideas are things. So groups of people produce things, nouns, um, <laughs> objects, ideas, uh, utensils, artifacts, stuff. They take this uh, noun and they hit it against this other noun and then you get a new <laughs> noun. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> Nouns propagate, I guess. And so that's kind of what you just said. We, we Groups of people produce things. And then we come to, the, well, why, why, do, why does this group produce things different from that group? And that's what I was trying to lay the foundation for. One, different religious commitment. Two, working with different stuff down to your own DNA. But uh, we, we often think of high culture, as you said, in terms of operas and ballet and things like that. But for our purposes, and generally when this is discussed at length anywhere, the, the, the lines between high culture and low culture are ambiguous at best. <laughs> and for our purposes, we will be content to say that it's the stuff that a group of people, the things that a group of people produce intentionally. There's some things we produce unintentionally. You might argue that that's culture too, but we'll leave that for someone else to debate. <laughs> but the stuff, that, the things that we that we produce in in our social setting, that's culture. So, scrambled eggs in the morning. My daughter's creating um, pictures of Marvel superheroes, or of sunsets, or Monet's. Is it Monet's garden? Or no, with the Monet's water lilies. Water lilies. Yeah. Okay. He had a garden or, where he kept the water lilies. Okay. <laughs> or our garden in the backyard where we grow green onions and tomatoes that are being attacked with something weird on the bottom. And mm -hmm. um, and um, peppers of various sorts. These are all manifestations of culture. When we sit down and tell stories to one another, these, this is culture. Uh, and and you, can, you could yourselves name off uh, all kinds of things. And, and we do them because we are creative beings made in the image of God. We can't not. There's a wonderful section in um, Chesterton's The Everlasting Man. Ever read it? Started it. Um, I, I I have not finished it because when he got very heavy in his praise of, of Rome. Oh, because yeah. They're, he goes off. Because their pagan, their pagan gods were better than Carthage's <laughs> pagan gods. Yeah. Oh, well, that, but he, he... Oh, of the original Rome, not just the Roman yeah. Catholic Church like you'd <laughs> no, expect. But, no, well, see, because he wants to be able to move and slide out of pagan Rome into papal Rome, he needs to... You repeat to yourself. He, yeah, he needs to... Anyway, he needs so to he, read Augustine's City of God. That's what he yeah. needs to do. <laughs> I'm, he I'm to sure do. he did, <laughs> to be fair. He, he needs read to it read it again. Right, with the right <laughs> mindset. I mean, his, his, his point is, is okay as far as it goes. Yes, the gods of Carthage devoured babies, but the Roman gods didn't do that as much. <laughs> but they were still demonic, and it was that Rome that uh, sanctioned the crucifixion of Christ and that murdered the apostles. But anyway, point, I don't even know where that was going. Oh, yes, Chesterton um, commenting on man as always being man pointed out that, that even if you look at cave paintings to decide whether or not the caveman was human, you see art. Uh, he, man is always an artist. The horse does not progress from his blue period to his red period. He does not begin in realism and move to cubism and then on to surrealism. Horses do what horses have always done. Uh, when I was a kid, there was, there was the common belief that animals, for instance, never use tools of any sort. Well, they do. We know that on a limited basis. And, but they never develop power tools. <laughs> they never start mining so those tools can get really good because now they've discovered metal. They have not progressed from classical to romantic to jazz to rhythm and blues or blue rhythm and blues to jazz to rock and roll. They just don't. 
I mean, a mockingbird may pick up a new sound because he's heard it, but he didn't create it. Mockingbirds don't sit around and, and generate new tunes and talk about theories of composition. Man is creative. Man is the image of the creator. And so man naturally creates, but what he creates, again, the two things he creates out of his own heart with its basic religious commitment, and he creates on the palette of God's creation. And because of this, he's never neutral. There's no such thing as a neutral culture. He is either serving God with God's stuff, including himself, since he too is the property of God, or he's serving an idol with God's stuff, in which case he's stealing on multiple levels. But he can't stop being creative. He can't stop producing stuff, things, in a social setting. And so um, one of the issues that, and Brian addressed this a good deal last time with uh, his discussion of um, meats offered to idols. Hmm. Uh, this becomes a question in some ways of common grace. I've never liked that, that phrase because some of the arguments that swirl around it. But it is certainly true that God upholds the universe for the sake of his son and that he restrains sin even in unbelievers, and that therefore unbelievers are able to produce objects that Christians can use, whether it's meat offered to idols, who, which the Christian receives in faith without too many questions, or whether it be the, the vineyards and the wells and the fields of Canaan, which God's people took by the sword and enjoyed. But there are some things that most certainly are idolatrous as they are and, and that we can't redeem short of burning them down and using them for kindling or something. I talk, we talked last time about um, idols, which is what Deuteronomy emphasizes a good deal. Uh, in our culture, pornography, there's, there's no valid use for pornography, but that's not because there's, the, there's um, concentrated evil in the ink or the paper, but because men have put their stamp on it in such a way that we can't take the stamp off. So we have to reduce it to its basic elements, burn the thing up, and that doesn't make us anti-art. It doesn't make censorship evil. Rather, it's to recognize that some forms of communication between human beings are evil. And some symbols that we raise up in worship are evil. And the sin comes from us. So the culture task then becomes bringing God's law to these things that we've made and distinguishing, or preferably bringing them in advance. We're going to be looking at the stuff that's already happened measuring it by God's law, we're going to be looking at stuff we're going to do tomorrow and saying, is this in conformity with God's law? And, and again, this is where some Christians would not be happy with what I've just said for various reasons. Thoughts from you two? Yeah, uh, I'd like to clarify, if I can, um, when we talk about Christian culture then, this is more just moving on than a clarification, but... Um, <laughs> When we talk about a Christian culture, we're not talking about Christian books and Christian movies and Christian music as we see them today. We're talking about books and mu movies and music that are made by Christians to glorify God. Is that correct? Um, generally, yeah. I mean, some people might want to include things that grow out of a Christian context mm -hmm. that reflect a Christian worldview. And they might feel that the word Christian might still rightly belong to that in that it reflects or, or displays Christian truth. We can look at some of the authors and composers and artists of the past who did wonderful, beautiful things. And we can look at their art and we can see the glory of God. But when we look at their lives, we find out, wait a second, I, you did this and I'm not seeing any sign of repentance. And uh, you believe that and that's called heresy. And uh, hmm. We've got to be very careful with that. Uh, we have to be careful, one, not to judge men's hearts without sufficient evidence and need. We're generally not called to, to judge such things at all, unless we're a church council or something. But uh, we, we can still say, I think, validly, that a culture that is dominated by Christian thought forms, by, by Scripture, uh, can produce things that we may still describe, if, if we even want to use the adjective, as, as Christian culture, Christian art, and such. But so we're talking yeah, about ethical conformity. Ethical and theological conformity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is this... I, I, I put that in because ethical ought to include the, theology. It, it's kind of a sin to recreate God in your image, which is what heresy <laughs> does. 
but not everyone sees that. Oh, well, you know, adultery, that's sin. But being wrong about who Jesus is, he means well. That's no big deal. No, the Bible doesn't. Um, interestingly enough, yesterday, and I think on some other occasion recently, the last verse in 1 John has come up for me. Twice in church yesterday. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. But as you're reading through 1 John, there's no discussion of, of idols made with men's hands. The whole thing is a discussion of false Christs, antichrists, pseudo Christs. Yes, I know it's pseudo Christ. Um, <laughs> pseudo, it's a psi. <laughs> you say the p. Um, <laughs> when I first read into the word, it was some, doing some role playing in our our uh, game master. <laughs> Kept talking about pseudo dragons. <laughs> pseudo. <laughs> and it took me having heard that a dozen times before I said, wait a second, how is that spelled? It's spelled like the words pseudo. <laughs> but ever since then, it's been pseudo. I mean, if you want to be yeah. really pretentious, it's pseudo. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Not that pretentious. Um, but that's what that's what First John is about. And and so when you get to the end, it's it's like a punch to the to the gut to tell these readers. Look out for idols. These things aren't just intellectual peculiarities, abnormalities, defections. You are creating idols by redesigning Jesus. Mm -hmm. So idolatry is not just a sin of the hands or of the will. It's also a sin of the intellect. And it can be done without ever making anything with your hands if you simply commit to another, another God, another Jesus. And when you say intellect... <laughs> Do you mean yeah. only the analytical faculty? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know where, I don't know where that question's going. So oh, I just, I, I want to break down the artificial distinction between the mind and the heart. In yeah, so far as about, it's artificial. Yeah, we talked about that uh, mm -hmm. last time, I think. Uh, it was Brian that brought it up? I don't know. What if you did? The heart is not simple. So the heart's not the emotions. Neither is it the intellect. Although it's tied to the intellect, it's tied to the emotions, tied to the will. Uh, a man thinks in his heart. A man also feels in his heart. A man chooses out of his heart. The heart is the religious center of one's being. It's I. It's the self. It's the ego. It's what deep, where deep down you hold your priorities, your values. It's where your God is. What is that focused on? And so, yeah, the, the heart can sit intellectually or volitionally or emotionally. And, and having used those three those three terms does not mean that they are three separate <laughs> rooms of the soul or some such thing. But for lack of a better phrase, they're three facets, dimensions. They're looking at the same thing from three different directions. All of this, of course, is analog analogical language, metaphorical. We, when, when we think through logical propositions, we, we know that that's not the same thing as standing up and cheering at a happy ending, mm -hmm. uh, nor is it the same as forcing yourself out off the couch to go get the ice cream during the commercial break. Um, these, and yet it's the same person doing this. And your, your, your heart is not wandering from room to room in your soul while this is happening. There is essential unity to the human ego, to the, the heart. So backing up now to, I, I didn't, we kind of wandered off, but you, you were contrasting what I've been trying to describe as, as Christian and ethical, oh, that's how we got there, ethical, theological, that is true. Mm -hmm. Whether it's true to, as, as scripture commands us in terms of how we are to think, how we're to feel, how we're to choose, or whether and we, t we tend to think of that as ethical. There's a standard that we're to obey, but also truth as revelation. And we still have to obey that in that we have to hear it, receive it, believe it, accept it, and then figure out what to do with it. So we can talk of, of a theological standard. We can talk of an ethical standard. Not, not that there's some kind of airtight compartment here. They're just different ways, again, of looking at the full revelation of God in Scripture and how it commands all that we are. Now, you were contrasting what uh, evangelical culture, I, I would like to think it's getting beyond. I haven't heard as much of it, but maybe I'm traveling in the wrong circles. But when I was a kid, yeah, Christian meant church-like. Uh, a Christian radio station is one that basically plays church sermons and music all day long. 
Christian art, oddly enough, is pictures of Jesus. <laughs> I assume Presbyterians and, and Reformed Christians would disagree with that one. It's um, a Christian, I don't know, what else is there? Christian, Christian romance is, novels about yes, the, women who move out to the frontier and become deaconesses in small towns. <laughs> I missed that one. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I guess. Christian shoelaces, they have Bible verses on oh, them. Oh, yeah. Christian superheroes. Christian <laughs> men's Bible tes man. testaments. Oh, testaments. testaments, yeah. Yes. Well, at least they're, they're just doing good to your neighbor, I guess, and loving your neighbor by killing your bad breath. <laughs> but the idea that all of the, oh, the, to be Christian, you have to have it. You make your car Christian by putting on a bunch of bumper stickers. I got no problem with bumper stickers, but if you think that improves your the ethical quality of your driving, you are mistaken. <laughs> and sometimes you may even bring shame to the name of Jesus. Like, look at that Christian car. He just cut off three other people. So I guess my wife says, well, at least we know the car is converted, but we can't say anything about the driver. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that, that kind of Christian as an adjective means that we're trying to make it church-like. And we're, we're saying, you know, you don't have to make something religious. Anything man does is religious. Mm -hmm. The question is, which religion? Now, that doesn't mean we can't distinguish between the Lord's Day and the rest of the week, between formal worship with church liturgy and serving God in your garden or praying at your bedside or eating a good meal and giving God thanks. There's all kinds of manifestations of serving God. And what God gives us in church is something very special. We, we need to recognize that. It does not help to try to take that and smush it out and spread it mm -hmm. over all the week. Mm -hmm. In your daily if, quiet time. Yeah, so as to well, replace the corporate reading of the word. Yeah, I mean, I have, a, I have nothing against daily quiet times. Yeah, you know, read yeah, your Bible. They're, they're, that you should read your Bible, yeah. but you should also go to church. Mm -hmm. And honestly, one of my um, complaints, I'm trying to find a nice word, with what the church has been doing during the whole this whole quarantine thing, has been that often we have tried to substitute. And, and, and when it's all you can do, when the church is on the run, when the church is persecuted, yes, you have to adapt. And God will bless you and take care of you. But when you have real choices where you could do something a little more biblical, and you choose not to because being online and seeing it with your eyes on a TV mm -hmm. or computer screen is good enough. You've missed something huge mm -hmm. because that's not what God said to do. He didn't say stay in your homes and watch images. You know, there's something in the Reformed Confessions about God not wanting to be represented in pictures and images, but to be represented by the lively preaching of the word. More on that next week. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's right. We're coming back to that, so I won't belabor that anymore. Uh, so, yeah, as we're, as we're talking about, about Christian culture, we're talking about culture as Christians ought to do it, and as culture as Christians do, in fact, do it, with a full recognition that Christian culture does not mean perfect culture any more than Christian means perfect man or woman. Uh, if I look over at my friend Bob or Ned or Ted or Ed and say, hey, these guys are Christians— I don't think anyone would think, oh, they, that means that they are flawlessly sinless saints who should be imitated in every, in every detail. No, it means that they believe in Jesus, and if they die today, they go to heaven. Doesn't say anything particular about the degree of sanctification, progressive sanctification, at least. And so when we start talking about Christian culture, some people are offended at the very notion, well, it's, it's flawed, the side of heaven, the side of the resurrection. Yeah. <laughs> Is this a surprise somehow? We call you a Christian, and we know you're flawed. We don't, therefore, yank the title away from you. We're talking about influences and commitment and the general direction with a full recognition that tomorrow's Christian culture should, at least could, be better than yesterday's because of the thing called progressive sanctification, covenant continuity over time. We draw on what our fathers have done, and we learn and internalize it, and we do better, or at least teach our kids to do better. And it's a slow and imperfect process, and sometimes we go down blind alleys, and sometimes we really screw things up, and it takes a few generations to recover. And yet, overall, what we have seen in this passage in Micah is the nations flowing to God's house to worship, and the affirmation they make is, 
we will, he will teach us his ways, we will walk in his paths. And this is possible because the law goes forth from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The result is an end of cultural and social warfare and everyone sitting under their vine and fig tree. Mm. And it ends with a sum up because people do walk in the names of their gods. If this is your God, if Jehovah is your God, if Jesus is your God, then that ought to influence all of your life, all of your thinking, all the stuff you make, your your normal stuff at your job. This this and this this we saw manifest in the Reformation as the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. I was uh, I don't remember what I was reading something really stupid, um, <laughs> because they were whoever the author was was trying. It might have been. It might have been and almost certainly was something online, someone's blog or reference or something, trying to explain the Puritan work ethic. And they summed it up like this. See, the these Protestants believed that salvation is a matter of works. Oh, so goodness. if you work harder, you will get to heaven better. I mean, was this one of those post- Capitalist deconstructionist. <laughs> no, this is called ignorance. It's okay. demonstrably <laughs> false. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. And of course, Max Weber was the soci German sociologist who tried to formulate a thesis that took the Puritan or Protestant concept of theology and show how that led to people working and how work, oddly enough, often produces prosperity. Isn't that strange? <laughs> um, like this needed a PhD anyway. <laughs> I don't remember from Germany. But what the Reformation simply said is, you're always a priest. Luther's idea, the, the, the cobbler fixing shoes at his bench, is as much or more of a priest. It's, it's his religious service is better than that of the monk or the hermit in his cell, off, in the, off doing nothing. Because this man is glorifying God with his action, with his sweat, with his mind, and he's showing love to his neighbor by making something that's productive. So what we're talking about is no, it's nothing strange to reform theology. Uh, in, in many respects, it was this very concept, often unconscious, that shaped Western culture with all of its flaws, because it wasn't the only influence. But the idea that men should work hard in the real world that they should create things that are useful in their society, that they should buy, sell, and trade freely, unhindered by civil government, and that in the process they and their peoples will prosper, that much as far as you go is Christian. Now, of course, the, the, the thing I didn't say is that this should be done by faith in Jesus Christ. And if you pull that out, then you secularize the whole thing and you get laissez-faire capitalism, and which has its ups and downs and its ins and outs but it's a whole lot better than the socialism of the modern world. Uh, at least it has some flagpoles in reality to keep it grounded. <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're, we're distinguishing between I'm backing up again, cause I'm, I'm kind of lost now um, <laughs> looking, looking for, looking for signposts. So we're distinguishing what a generation or two ago was Christian culture, meaning make everything look like church. But we're also rejecting the idea that the Bible has nothing to say to culture, that it's a separate realm where Christians can putter along in terms of natural law and their own secular gifts in a secular sphere. And as long as they're relatively nice to their neighbors, that's not really too much of God's concern, nor should it be that of the churches. Uh, the church is not a culture factory in the sense that it should not be setting up art studios or movie theaters or such. That's not its job. But as a, that's not its job. <laughs> yeah. It, it, and we're back to the church has a special place. Not every tree in the garden was the tree of life. Mm. But if you're going to eat of those other trees, you better be coming back to the tree of life on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. uh, the worship of God should define and influence all of life. And again, as in Micah, as the nations come to worship God, they receive instruction and they go out and they walk. And notice the metaphor. That's not just stand. They walk. They move forward in God's ways, with increasing cultural influence. Because the alternative is some other God's going to get his stuff done. Because man is inevitably religious. It's never a question of, of the God of the Bible versus no God in particular or a neutral God. It's always who's God. And in every part of our life, whether it's our, our calling, our day-to-day -day work, as moms and dads, as students, whatever, we are always supposed to be serving Jesus. And everything that comes out of our heart that's fired by faith, motivated 
by Christ. Uh, it's for the glory of God, done it according to his, his law. Again, quoting the Heidelberg, paraphrasing the Heidelberg Catechism. These are good works, the good works that God, God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Mm -hmm. Next week, we will pick up this conversation and talk more about images and how God represents himself to us and ordains that the gospel be communicated and things like that. Um, it is time to play a game. This is just to sort of let us get to know each other a little better, to let our listeners get to know us and our particular weird humors. <laughs> Quirkiness. Quirkiness. Yes. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> but I have asked each of you to tell me your favorite Bible story in the most boring way possible. So I, I describe it boringly first, and then you have... The way I've described it, you're probably going to at least understand where it's from. But then I, I assume that the goal is to explain where it is in the Bible and what the story actually is. Yeah, if necessary. If necessary. <laughs> okay. A man gets mad at his friends when they bring him water from out of town, so he spills it on the ground. <laughs> okay, that's obscure. I it's know what you're talking good. about, but I'm going to yeah. guess that you you win this one, probably. <laughs> just oh, just wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Oh, boy. Oh, really? No, that oh, was really right. good, though. I like that. That was. That, that was good. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go next. I don't know if I can even begin to match you, but um, it goes something like this. There's these, these couple of guys walking down this dry, dusty road. And a stranger overtakes them and notices that they're sad. And he says, "What's so what's going on? And they tell him about how bad things are. And he, uh, he says, oh, well, you guys are a bunch of idiots because uh, let me tell you what's really going on. He tells them and uh, stays with them till dinner time. And as they sit down to eat, he just vanishes. That's it. <laughs> I got that one. That's pretty good. Good. Yeah, I like that. And that is a great yeah, story. It's one of my favorites when it's told correctly. <laughs> one of the greatest, I think one of the greatest lines in scripture is, what thing? It's so good. <laughs> so good. <laughs> it's fun. All right, Emily. All right. Mine is as follows. Area man threatens home defense against traveling salesmen. What was the first word? Area, Area. man. Local, oh. A local fellow threatens the traveling salesman. The only thing that's coming to mind is secondhand lions, but <laughs> and I had Bible, that in obviously. mind as I was paraphrasing this Bible story. I'm sorry, you're right. You wow, got you did win. That is so obscure. Um, one more time, just to see if I traveling salesman does what? Area man threatens. Oh, area man. Yeah. Home defense. I guess you could say civil defense against traveling salesmen. Salesmen is plural. I was just going to ask. Oh, salesmen. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. I am being drawn back to the book of Judges, I, but I can't make it work. It, it's I not kind judges. of think I know what it is, but who is man, it, Brian? You're doing better than I am. I want to say that it's Joseph with his brothers, no, but it's not. No. Dang. Okay. They this. weren't technically traveling salesmen, but yeah. well, they were traveling. Yeah, they were because they sold him in Egypt. Oh, and they that's were traveling. True. Ah, that's true. Hey, we found another <laughs> so, one that works. Good job. <laughs> you want to give us a hint, or you don't want to just leave I'll, it for I'll just, our audience to guess? I'll tell the story as it should be told because it's one oh, okay. of my favorites, and you never hear about it in Sunday school. But this <laughs> is from the book of Nehemiah. Oh. <laughs> So what happens? I am so is ashamed. You have all of these merchants selling stuff on the Sabbath, and Nehemiah's like, "Guys, you can't do commerce on the Sabbath. You're supposed to keep the Sabbath day holy. So next week, the gates are going to be closed, and you can't come into town and sell stuff sell stuff on the Sabbath." But the merchants don't believe him, so they come back the next week, and the gates are closed, and Nehemiah is standing up on the wall, going, "You look like you're putting us under siege." You better go away or I'm going to, like, defend the city here with spears and arrows. And it's great. That's true uh, leadership, in my opinion. Yeah, it is. Good choice. And I completely 
Well Forgot done. about the restoration era, which shame on me. I'm supposed to not do that. <laughs> uh, mine for anybody who missed it was, of course, um, Jesus overtaking the two men on the road to Emmaus. And I left out the part where he gave them a three hour long um, study of biblical theology because I thought that would get <laughs> And Brian, you want to? Yeah, Explain so I'm going to read doing. mine again, just so that we refresh it. Mm -hmm. A man gets mad at his friends when they bring him water from out of town, so he spills it onto the ground. And this mm -hmm. is the story uh, out of Second Samuel, where David offhandedly remarks how he really, really wishes that he had some water from his hometown of Bethlehem, like from the well there. And, but, you know, it's, it's in Philistine territory, and he's sad because he doesn't get to have this. And so 30 of his mighty men go, hey, guys. Let's go get it. And they fight through the Philistine lines. They get water from the well. They fight their way back through <laughs> Philistine lines. They bring it back to him. And he goes like, you guys are idiots. You could, <laughs> one of you could have gotten killed and I would have felt horrible. And instead he pours the water out as a drink offering to the Lord. And it's my favorite because it is a wonderful image, for image of Christ's work. Living water comes from mm -hmm. Bethlehem to Jerusalem to be poured out as a drink offering before the Lord. Oh, that's real good. Oh, that's the good yeah. stuff. All right. Any recommendations to leave our listeners with before we go? Do I? <laughs> I went first on the thing, so... <laughs> I went first on the, the boring Bible story, so I can go last. No, I think All that... All right, well, I'm, okay. I'm going to recommend... Um, a sermon by my friend Paula Barati. We're meeting outside and the air in California is visible, but he preached. He preached a great sermon on the first commandment hey. and said a lot of the stuff that uh, I managed to get in tonight, but even more stuff that I didn't. And it's just, uh, you can find it on Sermon Audio, I'm sure, Covenant Reformed Church, Sacramento, Paula Barati, and it's probably simply titled The First Commandment. All right. We'll find a link if it is okay. available by the time we publish. If not, we will find okay. it afterwards and put it in afterwards. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Okay, Brian? Emily, you're oh. next. I wanted Brian I to go next. It doesn't. I can All go right, next. All right, Brian. Brian, go next. I'm going to recommend a website that I actually mentioned before we started recording the podcast, which is called thriftbooks.com. I, I can vouch at least that they got all the books I ordered to me. Uh, it's not a scam. You know, the, <laughs> the things I worried about when I found it. Uh, but basically, various used booksellers across the nation use this as like a rallying point online. And you can buy hardcovers and softcovers, even audio books for at least 50% off most of the time. Sometimes they're more expensive than you'll find them on Amazon. So you just, I always have two tabs open and do the comparison <laughs> thing. Be like, which one's the better deal? But I got 12 books from them. Uh, this week. So I'm very excited and very happy to report that it works. Nice. Oh, I got one more. My wife has a, a recommendation. She said, I, can you recommend Judy Rogers' song on the Ten Commandments, since we're going to be doing that? It's designed for children. I don't know. Well, wait, you both went to Cornerstone. Kindergarten graduation. Remember? Now I didn't go to have kindergarten. No other there. gods but me before no idol binge or something like that. Anyway. That's yeah. right. I there remember hearing this multiple times. Yes. You didn't what do you mean you didn't go to kindergarten graduation? Everybody went to kindergarten graduation. Well, once. Maybe <laughs> twice if you count when I was okay. teaching. That's all. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> all right, Emily, what is all your right. recommendation? Well, I was gonna talk about some books I bought, but since Brian already talked about buying books. Oh no. <laughs> All right. I'm going to copycat Brian and recommend a way of buying books, which is local church book sales. Um, mm. I live down the street from a Catholic church, and they had an outdoor masked up book and treasure sale on Saturday. And we stopped by. We were um, going out to pick up some furniture for our new home the same day. And so we stopped by. And within 15 minutes, we had. 15 books and we paid about $15 for the 15 books that we found in the 15 <laughs> minutes. So it was a really great experience and I recommend it heartily. That is like the book version of the metric system of measurement. One minute <laughs> contains one book costs $1. That's right. 
<laughs> so. But wait, Emily, you went to a Roman Catholic facility to buy books? What did you buy? <laughs> I bought a bunch of stuff. Um, we bought The Way <laughs> Things Work, Volumes 1 and 2. Uh, we bought Excellent. a little book of French grammar. We bought... Oh, I don't know. There was something about, like technical blueprinting like one of those really old <laughs> manuals that's like this oh, is wow. the kind of pencil you should use and this is how tracing paper <laughs> works uh, so just a bunch of really cool stuff like that i i love antique books i also love paying for books like they are not antiques like they are just old things that nobody wants because apparently that's what they are for some reason um but i want them so i'm happy to pay a dollar or 50 cents for them oh we also got calvin and hobbes for 50 cents that was the one paper well, there you go. i bought was a calvin and hobbes yukon ho so <laughs> nice. i also recommend calvin so, and hobbes um there we go yeah. <laughs> so so something calvinistic and a roman catholic <laughs> yeah <laughs> They they had all sorts of books. Some of them were trash, not of the Roman Catholic variety. There were a lot of Roman Catholic books as well. But, you know, it's uh, it's always worth looking. People don't want stuff for some reason. And sometimes their trash is your treasure. So Yes, indeed. That's very true. Yeah. All right. That's all the time we have for tonight. So thank you so much for this conversation. I look forward to continuing it next week. Thank you also to our listeners and to our financial supporters. We really appreciate you helping us keep the show rolling. If you would like to join our supporters by giving us a financial gift, you can do so by visiting our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Uh, you can like our Facebook page where we post our episodes every week. We also post them on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and pretty much everywhere. If there's somewhere that you would like to get our podcast that we don't currently publish to, let us know um, and we can do our best to fix that. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you can join us again next week. Mm-hmm.